Welcome everyone to UK Health Radio and our show, New Life Perspectives. Today we have an exciting episode for you with Jacob Cooper. Jacob Cooper. Cooper has written a few books based upon his near-death experience and past life regressions. Jacob is a therapist and shares his thoughts uh, about the mysteries of life on the other side of the veil. In addition to the peace and euphoria in the afterlife, we also experience these feelings in the physical world. There is so much more to live for as we are much more resilient than we imagined. Jacob's experiences provide the guidance for others to experience past life memories by assisting in the development of self-awareness and finding meaning in their experience. Jacob holds a master's in social work a degree, and he's also a licensed clinical social worker, certified Reiki master, certified hypnotherapist, specializing in past life regression therapy. As a psychotherapist, Jacob works with individuals, groups, and families to uncover emotional barriers and promote uh, improved wellness, achieving resiliency. Jacob Jacob incorporates mindfulness and spiritual approach to focus on the connection between the mind, body, and spirit. In effect, this teaches individuals how to improve their cognitive processing and shift their perspectives. Jacobs is a sought-after speaker on grief, wisdom, and consciousness, offers meditations and mindfulness seminars to individuals and groups, many of whom have been diagnosed with cancer, developmental disabilities, and experiencing systems of aging. Jacob has presented at Edgar Casey's Association for Research and Enlightenment, that's A-R-E, the EINS, uh, which is the International Association for Near-Death Studies, the Forever Family Foundation, helping parents heal sp- uh, and spiritual centers, international universities, public libraries. He's sought after with major media outlets and has been featured as a guest on CBS, Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie, Eins Radio, The Death Life with Allison Dubois at 94.3 The Shark, Jeffrey Wands and uh, with Jeffrey Wands. And he has published articles with the Huffington Post and Thrive Global. Please welcome Jacob. We're so honored to have you here, Jacob. And I have been looking forward to this conversation. If uh, you're listening to this, you probably have an interest, like most of us do, in the near-death experience. And we're getting to talk today with somebody who has been through it himself. And not only that, but he helps other people that have been through it. Welcome, Jacob. Bill, thank you so much for having me. A real honor. Uh, Thank you so much for having me on your program. Thank you. So, Jacob, tell us, how'd you get here? You were you were you were born, and uh, what happened to you? How did this How did this all occur? You're right. I I was born. I think we were all born. I was born. I was. Reborn, I died and I came back and I'm born again. But I had a near death experience, like you mentioned, uh, you know, at just the age of three years old, you know, due to pertussis and whooping cough that forever impacted the life that I live today, um, you know, immensely. What's pertussis? I've never heard of this. Pertussis is another, um, is really, is really the generic, um, it's it's a highly contagious like upper respiratory virus, otherwise known as whooping cough. And so for infants, children, and adults, you know, it could be fatal if left untreated. Um, and so I had this, you know, whooping cough at a very young age that led to my own near-death experience, uh, you know, which was really due to suffocation, you know, as a result of whooping cough. So uh, three years old, I can't even imagine what this did 
you know, to you and your parents, right? You got a three-year-old, you feel so vulnerable as a parent, you know, when you, you've got a child with something like this. So walk us through, you're three years old, what happened? What do you remember? How did this go down? How did that happen? Yeah. To preface, I was not with my parents. I was with family friends. Um, you know, these uh, family friend happened to be my babysitter, and she would take care of me and my you know family while my parents worked. Uh, but I went to a, a playground, you know, with them and my siblings and you know their kids, and I climbed onto a ladder onto a slide, and I just got into this kind of coughing spurt. You know, did a whooping cough, and you know, at the top of the slide, on you know when I was climbed the ladder. I just began to suffocate and there was literally uh, nothing to hold on to. And it's the scariest moment of my life. I don't want to sugarcoat you know, how uh, scary suffocating was. Uh, but then I just recognized my body was slowly beginning to shut down, you know, due to suffocation, you know, so rather than being in a car that's not going to work or start, you know, I got out of the car and just checked the engine, popped the hood and checked the engine, and just was able to become aware what was happening in my body. And it was just as if you're in a basement and you at a power breaker, you just shut off all the units that was happening uh, to my physical body as a result of suffocation. Um, the last part of my you know, physical instrument or my body that I was aware of was within my brain. And I became aware that my brain was just being deprived of oxygen. And it just, I literally just felt a snap in half within my brain, like a large crack and, you know, there's a saying that we have, you know, my brain cracked open and that's when God came in. Well, I, that literally happened to me <laughs> where my brain was so deprived of oxygen that I just felt this large snap in half. And that's when I really had this profound near-death experience. And I crossed over, you know, to the other side, you know, which I highlight in both of my books, you know, Life After Breath and the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. But this was a profound experience in which I could best described as a returning to home, a returning to a place of where my soul is at home. And so I encountered, you know, my own spirit guides or guardian angels. I encountered, you know, countless angels in this experience. I became aware of who I was and not only this life, but past lives and what I would be doing in this lifetime, uh, awareness of the all that ever is and ever was, or, you know, the only way I could describe that in our vernacular is God, but there are no words to describe it. But this was a profound, full-blown near-death experience that I had uh, that I look at to this day as a double-edged sword uh, in many ways. So so you here you are at the top of the slide, right? You know, right. there's there's the the physical, what I'm hearing is you literally choked out. And you and you felt yourself, your your body shutting down. And then did you feel yourself like leave your body? Were you aware yes. of that? Yes. I was not in my body. I my body was on the ground um afterwards because I was able to literally feel myself being pushed, you know, down the slide that I was about to go on, and my body was on the ground irresponsive to anyone that was calling my name. So my physical body was on the ground, and yet I could feel my own form to the side of it, my spirit form, my, my true form. Um, and so the people at the park that day were calling my name, uh, but I was irresponsive. My physical body was irresponsive to them, but I wanted to shake them and tell them that I was okay. So the suffocating part was the small degree of suffocation that nearly lasted almost two decades where people were looking at my body, were looking at myself, but they weren't really looking at me. Ah. And that so, lasted a long time. And you felt them when you went through the next 20 years, were you like, did you feel like you were kind of outside of your body when this was happening or were you in your body during Did my you... NDE, during my nde i was certainly out of my body um, i was certainly out of my brain and my body no question about it um 
but I, I will say that, you know, th that many times we associate our bodies with who someone is, you know, there's a synonymous, synonymous uh, understanding of who someone is with how we see them. Uh, but I would, I could tell you that's that's the real surface nature of who we are, particularly in kids and children. You know, we look at kids as just these blank canvases, these empty, you know, things that we have to imprint identities on. Uh, but in reality, the body physically that we see with children or anyone has an infinite soul inside of that physical body. And you know, for myself, after this near death experience, you know, I'm learning more about it each and every day, not necessarily what happened in my NDE, but how to find meaning and make sense of it in a way. Um, but, you know, after it, my father told me, you know, that I'm just kind of paraphrasing, but he said, you know, I told him, dad, something happened, but it's not going to make sense to you, but one day it will. But I, don't, I can't describe what happened to me. And this is quite common for even adults who have near-death experiences, bear in mind kids, is words are just so limiting to the experience, or it's such a sacred experience that you keep it so close to your heart. Not everyone is shouting it off at the mountaintops like many other near-death experiencers. A lot of people keep it very much to them and process it for many years. Yeah, that is uh, that is definitely uh, something that in, I would say, you know, before, you know, 15 years ago or so, there were a lot of people who literally said nothing about it. But now, you know, with the information that's come forward and the, you know, INS, the International Association for Near Death Studies, you know, a lot more people are more willing to talk about it. And they have resources now, information that they realize that, oh, okay, this is what happened. And right. Well, it's huge. I really credit Dr. Rima Moody, you know, my friend, and you know, he's on my first book, Endorsement, but he coined the term NDE. Without him, I just don't know if we would be talking about it to this degree, because when we're able to identify something, it could become something more universal and accepting you know, as a thing versus just this big phenomenon. But most of my life, I didn't have any vernacular to describe it, you know, up until my early college years when I you know, picked up a book called Embraced by the Light by Ed Betty Eighty, And that was my first understanding that, okay, this is something that I just didn't have that other people had. And so it was comforting and it had universality to it. Yeah. Now, when you, when you came back, uh, how long were you gone in earth time? I asked, you know, my guardians and my pre and my parents, this, they, they don't know. I think part of it was due to their trauma. Like they weren't, you know, when a kid's not responding, like they're not, you know, looking at the wristwatch, they're just <laughs> yeah. trying to, they're just trying to like get the kid up. So we had the emergency, you know, um, you know, the, the hospital, the, the emergency, I was rushed to the emergency room through the ambulance, um, you know, and I was laid in the hospital bed, but I could tell you this, the minute that I decided you know, that I was going to stay in my body, that I was going to stay in this lifetime was when I woke up. Uh -huh. so it, was, it was the power <laughs> of choice and decision to live. Uh, many near-death experiencers are given two options. They, they're told it's not their time, they have to continue, or there's autonomy. And I was given choice, you know, to, to stay. And you chose it. You remember choosing Appar appar it? Apparently I did because I wouldn't be here in front of you. I probably I probably would. I'd be coming through mediums or something like that, another channel. But uh I I chose and I chose because I I had a little bit of uh well I'm Jewish, but the word is chutzpah, right? So I, I had a little bit of that because I just said, you know, if I'm gonna stay, you know, what's this life gonna be? Why am I here? And I was shown you know, my future and what I would be doing, which is speaking in front of people, talking in front of a lot of groups. And in that moment, I understood that the other side is always going to be there, uh, but it doesn't have to be other. It doesn't have to be outside of this realm, that that in a way, having this experience would allow people to remember that part of themselves within this body, within this life. And so that window was very thin and it was a unique opportunity. And so to be of service to others and to give this to other people, you know, is why I'm here is to serve others and to remind others of 
who they are, where they're connected to, where they came from. You're a bridge, a bridge between two worlds. That and that requires chutzpah. So it does, it does, uh, you does. Did, that is not a minor <laughs> thing. No, no. Well, I just see myself as someone who gently taps them on the shoulder and just reminds them, hey, you know, there's something more. There's a you beyond the you. There's you know? a you beyond the you. <laughs> we got to take a quick break for UK Health Radio. Uh, we're going to uh, hear from our sponsors and we'll be right back. More really great stuff here with Jacob. I can't wait to hear about the information that's come in from the other side. UK Health Radio, take it away. And we're back. Jacob, so um, I had the good fortune. Uh, my book was picked up by the president of one of the uh, International Association for Near-Death Studies, and and he he called it the the lessons from an NDE without having one, mm -hmm. and uh, and so I ended up doing a tour around uh, helping a lot of people that had near death experiences, and at first before I had actually gotten into it, you know I I thought oh my God this is going to be so great I'm going to go into this room and I'm going to see all these enlightened souls, and I was so excited to get there. When I got there, I saw a room full of traumatized beings, mm. that they were people who had gone through this experience, and it's so overwhelming to go from, I'm just a normal guy working in my nine to five, and all of a sudden reality is blown apart. All of the beliefs of the ordinary person, all of the perspectives, this broader view. On top of that, there is what I call um, having all of these supernatural gifts. Their intuition, they move to a different dimension. They go from the third dimension to the fifth. And with that, they can feel what other people feel. And being a little boy of in the th three years old for you, you got lit up at a very, very early age. So did you end up as a life, as an empath? And did you, did you know this about yourself and, and the other, did you have other gifts that kind of came out of this that were kind of, well, uh, maybe you adopted them and, and integrated them or or they were a real challenge. Yes, you know, you do make a point that it is quite uh, common for people with NDEs to have after effects. And trauma is something that isn't necessarily spoken about. I think a lot of people focus on, you know, the uh, euphoric elements of people's NDEs and, you know, all of that. But there's there are double-edged swords. Uh, but as a young kid, I didn't have terms for it. I wouldn't go around saying I was a psychic, I was an empath. Um, it, it, it was more of a comfort zone for me to be in the higher realms, to be a dreamer and to really know how to really get there in a way uh, from being there. But I think my brain was very heavily impacted from the TBI that I had with suffocation. And so my brain... I could fully attest is just a filter of consciousness. It doesn't create it, doesn't produce it, it just filters it. So after having this experience, I was really able to be a filter between two realms. And this led to a lot of premonitions, a lot of mediumistic communication you know, as, as a young child. But it came to a point where I recognized I was very alone and I had this, you know, and I, I talk about this in Life After Breath. I remember very little about my childhood other than these profound experiences that, you know, either my breath is enhanced or like my breath is taken away. But, you know, there was an experience where I looked at a classmate and I was having, you know, all these experiences and seeing interdimensional kind of beings and the classmate just looked at me like I was from Mars. And, you know, that just kind of put a, put an, put a, you know, put a pin in my balloon, you know, it just deflated me. And I just, after that, just kept it very close to my heart. Uh, but, you know, there was times where I just 
you know, wanted to be a kid, but I would just have all these premonitions happen. And it just was almost more annoying than anything I could describe it. Yeah, I just wanted to do my thing, but I would see things, hear things, know things that, you know, other kids weren't. I kept it very close to me. And it's just, I couldn't live this reality because things that I would see would just come and just like, it was like deja vu all over again, as Yogi Berra would say. So um, in my early childhood years, it was a nuisance. Uh, but in my later years, you know, once I hit college, it was something that I embraced. Um, oh, you know. wow. So you, so what is it that caused you to shift? Because that's a, that's a significant shift to actually go and, and embrace it. What happened? I think there was many, I can't like say uh, this is a one thing, but you know, I think college in a way allowed me to breathe a lot more. You know, high school is very militant and it valued regurgitation over imagination. Where college, there was more room for creativity, expansion, you know, imagination. Uh, but I had a lot of people along the way that were just these kind of like angels in human forms that would just, you know, give me that same gentle tap on my shoulder that I'm giving to other people now, you know, to remind me. So this experience was always with me you know, sometimes stronger than others, but it was always there, you know, but I had other people in my life that I met that were, you know, that embraced this part of themselves and they understood that language. And I was able to kind of express what happened to myself in a way, and they wouldn't judge me. So the support system that I had and the models that I had was very pivotal in me, you know, owning this in a way um, versus just running away from it as I did as a kid. Mm. Mm. <laughs> So everybody is listening to this is, is, ah, uh, tell us, tell us the, you know, the top things that you are here to gift the world. Yes, I, I would say for one, you know, people listen to end ease or my experience, uh, not because it's something foreign, but because, because it's something familiar. And how you relate to that familiarity is different. Some people embrace it and some people push it away. But so my end to E is really a reflection of what we all have. We're all eternal beings. We all come from the other side, go to the other side. It's a one-way ticket there. And I think really, I don't have monopolization of the other side or heaven. I'm just a guy like anyone else. But it's my hope that people listening today will have some degree of recall about who they are, where they came from, where they're headed. Because uh, I think, really, if you don't know who you are, you could be anybody. If you don't know where you're going, you could be anywhere. So having a sense of true identity and direction is pivotal you know, in this journey. Uh, but I would say, um, at least for me, the gift that I have isn't necessarily giving people readings, but having this gift of my brain, you know, being, you know, having a TBI and just having this new downloaded information is that... Yeah, the best way I could see myself is a channel of inspiration and insight for other people. And I do that every day with my posts and the books that I write. Um, I do believe that things don't come from me, but come through me. So mm. I'm, I understood that, you know, they talk about the gifts that I give, right? And so for me, when I was suffocated and I had my NDE, I was shown eternal life. I was given that again. And so what I try to do within my work of service is to give back life to people who might feel lifeless because death does not exist, but we could be alive and feel dead inside. I know once we leave the body, we'll be good. So the key is, is to help people to live while they live. And that's what I try to do from the ground up as a therapist, psychotherapist, hypnotherapist, author, is just to infuse insight, inspiration, um, you know, it's others to really move the needle in their lives. Ah, that's beautiful. You know, um, I've been thinking about something recently. It's really, uh, really timely that I get to this time, this little brief moment with you. And I was thinking about that all of us that have come to the planet Earth, unlike you, don't remember. You literally took a body, if you're listening to this right now, right? 
uh, I got born and they given me a name. My name's Bill. Oh, okay. You're Bill. Oh, Bill, Bill, who lives on this street in this town and eats, you know, I, you know, I like Wonder Bread and Ding Dongs, you know, it's like, okay, you know, that's, you know, likes, dislikes and, uh, you know, all this type of stuff. But, but if you think for a moment, what before that, what happened before I got here and the, the amnesia is so very, very complete. Like I have no idea what happened before I before I was born. Like, I don't know. I just I'm here and I'm like I'm a guy having an experience. And one of the things that that I thought was that there is a gift in this this amnesia. And the gift is is that I get to completely forget and I get to come here and immerse myself in a game that seems so very, very real. It's real. I'm tasting things. I'm hearing things. But in fact, it's a game that has a beginning, a middle and an end. I come in and then I leave and I have an experience. And and with that amnesia, all of the other players in the game, I forget my purpose for being here. I forget the other players, remembering that maybe we've done this before, you and me. We've met each other long before. You know, the Chinese say that, you know, for, uh, you know, I don't know the exact thing, but I'm going to paraphrase this, but they have this wonderful thing. If you, if you are born on this planet at the same time as everybody else, you know, you've had uh, a lifetime together. And if you, if you find yourself in the same town as somebody going to the same high school, you've had a thousand lifetimes together. And if you uh, ended up getting married to this person, you've had 10,000 lifetimes together. So uh, this amnesia, right, uh, that we have uh, allows us to fully embrace ourselves in this game. What is your thoughts? I think I, I hear what you're saying. I think it's good to be balanced where we don't want to forget either part of ourselves. You don't want to forget that we're having these human experiences, but we don't want to forget that we're not just, we're, we're on this earth in a way, but not of it. I think the issue is, is when we do this, we become least in water, and that could be a problem. I think if we tap into something beyond this world, we could generate a change. I mean, you know, I look at any agents of change, they tap into something greater than what was around themselves. They tapped into something within. So I think we are one, but we are not the same. And each person has a unique role to play within this life. And the deeper you tap into that, the more change and impact you will have. And so I think, you know, it's good to embrace both our human and the spirit part of ourselves. You know, that could only enhance it. You know, we look at history when we just have too much human, there's problems, right? Yeah. You know? There's no cause and effect. There's no understanding of, you know, the, you know, you look at history, that's a problem. So I think if we're able to integrate both, then wow, we could really make a difference. We could be governed by seeing through the illusion, understanding that someone living around the world isn't separate from us, but connected to us. And there's causality and effect, and we are interconnected. I think in a way, a lot of people get into their own box of identity and it becomes very much self-serving and could lead to a lot of destruct. So I think having foundations and principles will allow us to make you know, real positive change that doesn't come from us, but through us, through another realm. So I think it's very good to stay connected. You know, it's like asking me, when I use my cell phone, should I not go on Wi-Fi? I mean, you can, but it's not gonna be as great of a call or a connection or a life as well. So can you do it? Sure. But you're better off 
you know, using this connection that will allow you just, you know, stronger impact and a stronger life and a more beautiful experience, you know, when you have it. So I think part of the issue is people get too imbalanced. Some people are just more over there than they're over here. And that's a problem. And some people are way too over here and not over there. So I think having both will, will do wonders for people. Oh, yeah, I, I, I concur. UK Health Radio, we're going to give you a chance here to, to tell us about our sponsors, and we'll be right back. So, Jacob, you're uh, at the break there, right before the break, we were talking about kind of the balance in between uh, being over in the afterlife or before this lifetime, and then also being here on the planet Earth and the benefits of having that connection. So how, how do we get there? How can we, you know, for, for most of us, right, we, we never have a near-death experience. Uh, and uh, it seems difficult. There's all these religions of the world which one's right? You know, what what spiritual path is right? Because I was born into this particular one. Is that the correct one? How do how do we get there? How do you help people to find their way back to that connection? Yeah, I, I think sometimes we view things right or wrong. And my approach is what's most skillful, what's most helpful, what's most resourceful. Um, at a certain point when I'm in first and second grade, it's best I do you know, certain activities, but then we evolve, we grow. So religion has its time and place, you know, you know, and they're there for reasons. But I think anyone could have a spiritual practice. I think spirituality could be found within religion, but it also could go beyond it as well. You know, it, spirituality wasn't born out of religion. You know, it transcends and it's very much individualized to each person as well as collect, you know, as well as there's universal elements to it. But if you don't have an NDE, that's not the only way to become awake or aware. You know, I think really it's learning how to get quiet. You know, and the more that we could get quiet, the more that we could see, hear, and feel. So, um, and again, this world is constantly running from one thing to the next to satisfy that part of themselves. And so I think if we're looking for truth and you're trying to solely find it, truly solely finding it outside yourself, you might be disappointed. But if people just change the angle that they're facing their lives and turn to this place within, they might be surprised of how beautiful and wise that part of themselves truly is. But it comes back to what we were talking about from a very early age, we're kind of programmed these blank canvases that in order to be something, we need to do something. You, in order to be good, we need to get a good grade or we need to do this. And there's a constant instability of identity that's based off the external world. Uh, and so I think in a way, we're not called a human doing, we're called a human being. And by being, it means you know, being connected, you know, being very much living from a place of inside out into a strong foundation versus the outside in, which is a lot of people live their lives, you know, their external experiences, you know, influence their internal, you know, reality. And that's problematic because the external world is very much in flux. So I think we'd have a lot more uh, stability and sense um, and meaning when we come from that deep place within. That's more control and we have more freedom from that place did you um because you had this experience at such an uh, extraordinarily young age right. one of the one of the effects that so many uh people that have been on the journey that you've been on is a realization that we are not judged we are only loved and that you've done nothing wrong and you're all right. You are all right. And, and with that, with that, that means there's no real punishment on the other side. You just simply 
are having experiences here. You get to fully in your life review, see the impact of everything you've done, but you're also loved at the same time. Yes. You know, it, it's, you know, it's different because we're so not used to this in this life, right? You do something, you go to the principal's office, you get condemned from oh, mom, yeah. dad, or grandpa and the whole community. So what I'll say is that this is, you are unconditionally loved, but you're also given unconditional opportunity. And I think each and every lifetime is a part of this earth school to learn and evolve and grow from lifetime to lifetime. And so I do believe in a sense of consequences that this isn't just mayhem, you can do whatever you want. And there's, but I think in a way we're here to rectify some of that stuff and to learn from it. And you could look at it as punishment. That could be one perspective, but I look at it as a beautiful opportunity, you know, to really evolve past through some, you know, habits that maybe we've carried over throughout different lifetimes. You know, uh, I love the way it was put that we're simply here given an opportunity to change our mind. That's right. Change our mind. Yeah. Well, we're artists of the mind, right? You know, in each day, in each lifetime, we could create different pictures and different images through the lives that we live based off of our belief system and how we see life itself. And so, um, so many people try to find God thousands of miles away from them, and that's okay. But when you embody God, that's really when you find it. When you mm. really step into that place of service, of love, of change, of seeing the depths of things and looking up at the world and not down at it, you're really thinking and seeing the world like God. <laughs> I love that, Jacob. Embodying it. Embodying right. it. Right. It's it's an interesting point because what comes first, the chicken or the egg, the life that we live and our experiences, does that inform God or does the viewpoint of God that we have inform the lives that we live? And I think they're both connected, how we live our lives and how we see God and how we view God and how that impacts our lives. You know. Yeah. 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 Embodiment. I love that. Jacob. Uh, like every episode here, it's like a Cracker Jack box. We've got a surprise gift for everybody that's uh, watching. You have uh, a, uh, a short uh, exercise for us. Now, you don't want to do this when you're driving, everybody. You want to you uh, uh, save this until you can uh, uh, be seated without some distraction. And uh, Jacob, take it away. Okay. So during this time, while you're listening to my voice, I'd like for you to take a seat on a chair or on a couch or any place of comfort. And if you're so called to do during this time, you can begin by gently focusing on your breath. So when you breathe in, you want to breathe out for maybe three counts. And when you breathe out, if you can, try to breathe out through your mouth through a couple more counts. So if you breathe in for three seconds, maybe you want to breathe out for five seconds or four seconds. So you're breathing in through your nose, kind of like visualizing a balloon. So you inhale, you inflate the balloon. And when you reach a point, you exhale, you deflate the balloon. And so... As we breathe in, we inhale, we feel ourselves inspired. We see ourselves going higher and higher, being aware of the pain that we experience or discomfort, but not enslaved by it. There is a greater channel that we're tuning into, and this breath will rise our awareness with each passing inhalation and each passing exhalation. And as you breathe in, you could allow yourself to visualize or use your mind's eye to go throughout your body and just scanning your body during this time, noticing any part of your body that might be holding on to tensions, feelings, or emotions as our thoughts 
lead to our feelings. Our feelings lead to our emotions and our emotions lead to our behaviors. So now is a time of recharging ourselves to get into alignment through our breath. And if there's something that we're holding on to, we could just simply lean into it and decide if we're ready to let it go. When we let go, our awareness and beauty will grow. So now during this time, your body, your brain, your breath are becoming one. They're not separate from each other. They're interconnected during this time. And as you're breathing, noticing that you might have a thought, try to visualize a stream of water in a river and our thoughts are just like these passing waves of water and the stream of uh, water from the river, just observing the river, but not absorbing it, just noticing that it's there and the water's job is just to flow and do its thing. So to our thoughts, just let them go. There's a you beyond the thought. There's a you beyond the emotion. There's a you beyond this life. And there's a you beyond this world. So now take a deep breath in, inhale, inflate, and exhale, deflate. Be in this awareness where all is well, was well, will be well. Stay with the breath. That's how you really will truly feel present. And continue this, and you could replay this over and over again for your own comfort. Thank you for tuning in. Oh, that is beautiful, Jacob. Thank you so much. Everyone, Jacob has two great books, Life After Breath and The Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. Uh, where can they get those books? Predominantly through Amazon, but I will be, you know, at places such as Lilydale, New York, outside of Buffalo, August 8th, as well as Chicago, mid-May, and uh, trying to go to your local places and potentially the UK. I know this is UK radio, so I have a couple of people in London who've reached out to me. So stay tuned for some potential international travels as well. Beautiful. And and what's your website? How can people get you? People could find me through my website at jacoblcooper.com. That's jacoblcooper.com. You could locate me there. Beautiful. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you for coming out. This is not easy. It's not easy to go down this road and be this bridge. Thank you. An honor. Thank you. Thank you for listening to UK Health Radio. Tons more episodes for you. I with Cracker Jack Box at the end of everyone, uh, go ahead and uh, look at the recordings and uh, you'll get much, much more. Thank you all. We'll see you next episode. Thanks for being here with us on the New Life Perspective radio show. For more information or to find out more about the work that Bill and I do, please visit us at cognomovement.com or email us at info at cognomovement.com See you again soon.